Guys in the back, if you would, help me out Psalm 139. So open your Bible, your Bible app, however you get there. <clears throat> if you can, read along with me. It'll be on the screens. Talking about heavenly chaos. This is our journey through praise and worship and helping us to understand that the things going on in the room are not the only things going on. There's more going on when you praise and worship God that you can't see than in the room that you can see. <clears throat> David said, where can I go from your spirit? <clears throat> where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed, listen, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell to the othermost parts of the sea, next verse, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Lord, bless your word in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. We talk a lot and we shout a lot and we talk to each other at this church. So tell your neighbor on both sides, say here we go, here we go, here we go. Matthew 18. I want to compare and contrast these two scriptures. This is Jesus, Psalms that was David, 700 years before Jesus, king of Israel, who wrote most of the 150 Psalms, which are the praise and worship songs of the Bible, of which many of our songs even today are still written out of those, okay? <clears throat> Jesus, 700 years later, David said, I can't go anywhere and you're not there. Jesus said this. He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. That is two different kind of theirs. Now I want to compare and contrast them, okay? There are three defining characteristics that make God, God. Okay, they're kind of theological words. It ain't something you gotta, you know, you're gonna be saying every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but it'd be helpful for you to know. One of them is omniscient. God is omniscient. Omni means all science, mean knowing. God knows everything. God doesn't forget. God doesn't learn. God doesn't get better. God doesn't recall because there's nothing he's ever forgotten. God is all-knowing, omniscience, omniscient. That is a characteristic that separates God from all life. He is an omniscient God, a characteristic that belongs only to him. Okay? The next is one called omnipotent, omni meaning all potent mean power or the root word of potential. All potential lies in God. If you are going to reach your potential, you got to understand that all potential lies in God. It is impossible for someone to fully possess everything that they're supposed to be and everything they're supposed to do outside of God's help. So even people with great accomplishments, if they didn't know God, they may have gotten further than others, but they fell far short of their potential because God is omnipotent. All potency, all potential is in God and that number two separates him from all life. Amen. Number three is the one I want to bog down in. He's omnipresent. God is everywhere at the same time. Amen. David said, I can go to heaven. He said, I can get on the wings of the morning. He said, I can make my bed, and the actual Hebrew word is Sheol, which also is a word for hell. He said, I can make my bed in hell. He said, and I cannot get away from you. It's amazing they used to talk about people running from God. Well, how are you going to run from somebody that's everywhere? Because he was in the place you left, and wherever you run to, he's there waiting for you. So there's no running, God, David said, I cannot get away from you. He said, if I sin, you're there. And if I'm good, you're there. If I do right, you're there. If I do wrong, you're there. He said, there is nowhere I can go and flee from your spirit. And we call this the omnipresence of God. That's why you don't have to be in church to call on him because he's everywhere. You can be in a bathroom, come on. You can be throwing up somewhere and say, God, get these drugs out of my system. You can call on the name of the Lord while you're in the checkout line at Target. You 
you can call on the name of the Lord when the car in front of you cuts you off. You can call on the, you can, Jesus said, call on me and I'll show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. Now, we got omnipresent, but Jesus takes it deeper. He said, I like to show up in a special way when my people gather. That's not omnipresence. That's manifest presence. I got, yeah, I got so much. I, manifest presence is when God will literally come and inhabit a room. I am not here to criticize everybody and say everybody's doing wrong and we got it right. But what I am trying to expose is you don't have to do anything for the omnipresence of God. Okay? But the manifest presence of God has a pattern. And we do not experience that manifest presence because those patterns are ignored. We have good people, love Jesus, authentic worship. We're filling up arenas, more record labels for Christians than we've ever had, more streaming platforms for Christians than we've ever had. I think when I started pastoring, there was one Christian record label, maybe two. Now they're everywhere. You have one here at this church. But just because you have people in a room worshiping does not mean God is inhabiting it. You can have passionate worship and God ain't there. Because for the manifest presence of God to come and settle amongst the people, there is a pattern because God is a God of pattern. Now this is, this ain't, you know, like last week, we just went wild. This ain't a going wild service, but this is so important. And the guys in the back debriefed me and said, Pastor, you need, I was going to skip this, but they said, no, you need to tell them. Now, to everything God, there is a way. Jesus said there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. So you can do marriage your way. And the beginning is not destruction, the end. He said, if you do things your way, it may start good, it may sustain a while. He said, but in the end, the thing's gonna deteriorate and collapse. He said, but my way is the narrow way. You see what I'm talking about? So God has a pattern. Like I said, we can call it keys, we can call it a pattern, but to everything God wants to give you, there is a way. <laughs> you, cannot, uh, you cannot serve God and live your way. And that is the most difficult thing probably amongst an atmosphere like this. That God is so good and he's so merciful and he's so loving and, and God will understand. Yes, you're still saved, but you're not gonna get that blessing. You're not gonna get that result because Bible results only come when Bible patterns have been obeyed, okay? And so the first yes that we say to Jesus is everything that Jesus wants to give to us. I wanna give you salvation, I wanna give you mercy, I wanna give you grace, I wanna give you a clean slate, I wanna wipe you clean. That's easy to say yes to. And we just had 12 more people say yes to that. That's the easiest yes you'll ever make. But there's a next yes, there's another yes. And the next yes is when you find out what God wants from you. And he said, now I want you to take up your cross Deny yourself, oh, and I want you to follow me. That ain't a popular gospel in America called deny yourself. You wanna empty out a church real quick? Start preaching the deny yourself series. <laughs> That's the second yes. 
A lot of people can't say the first yes. That second one's a whole lot tougher. Okay? It took me some time to say that second one. But if I hadn't said that second one, I wouldn't be here with you. I wouldn't be here with you. I wouldn't be here with any of you. I had to say the second yes. Okay? Now, the way the whole Bible works, from Genesis to Revelation, I'm, 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 giving, you, I'm giving you stuff people don't talk about. God gives the pattern, the people obey the pattern, and God rewards it with glory. God gives the pattern. When the pattern is obeyed, he rewards it with glory. Go home today and read Deuteronomy 20. If you hearken to the voice of the Lord this day to observe and do all these things I command you, then all these blessings shall fall upon you. Read on down to about verse 20. If you do not hearken to the voice of the Lord this day to do all these things which I have commanded you this day, then all these curses shall follow you. Nothing curses you from the outside. They can't no witch put a curse on you. You can't curse what God's blessed. I used to have a woman at our on the East Coast, she used to sit, come sit in the back and do bones in her hand and cast spells on me. They like, Sister Security, you want us to get her out here? I'm like, no, oh, let her sit up there. <laughs> Six months later, she was saved singing in the choir. Yeah. You, can't, you can't cast no spell on me. I'm the blessed of the Lord. I got a hedge of protection around me. You, what do you think you're going to come down here and cast a spell on me? You can't curse me. The only person that can curse me is me. You might not like my messages, but I have made a vow to you to tell you the truth. I will always tell you the truth. <laughs> so God pulls them out of Egypt. They're in sand. They have no judicial system. They have no moral code. They have no police. They have no economic system. They have no structure. Three million, 3.5 million, some philosophers say, standing in a desert. They needed God for everything. So God gave him 10 commandments, a moral code. What is he doing? He's starting to reveal something about himself. And then he wants to meet with them. Whew. It's a love story. He, he wants to be with them. He brought them out so he could be with them. And so he said, build me a tabernacle. How dare God take a bunch of slaves and say, take up an offering. God said, bring me these items. He told them that and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build me a tabernacle so I can meet with thee. He told them the skins. He told them the animal type skins. He told them the dye, that they were to dye the skins. He told them the dimensions. He told them the size. He told them the architectural layout and on and on and so forth and so forth. And the Bible says, read this, and Israel did exactly as the Lord commanded and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Oh, what's happening here? Something's happening. So now God says, I want you to make me a place where I can come and my presence can sit. We're going to make the Ark of the Covenant. So God told him the size. God told him the dimensions. God told him the materials. God told him the overlay. God said, I want two cherubim overseeing the mercy seat bent over with beaten gold. And I want the mercy seat set in the middle inside of the Ark. I want the tablets of stone. I want Aaron's rod that budded. I want some manna that dropped out of heaven, put it inside the Ark. And the Bible says they did exactly as the Lord commanded. And the presence of God came and sat on the mercy seat. Oh, we own to something. Then that David said, Lord, I'm living in a palace and you're still in a tent back that we built for you years ago. He said, I want to build you a palace. God said, you got too much blood on your hands because David was a man of war. He said, but you take up the offering from Israel and your son can build it. Solomon came and built the temple of God and the Bible says they, that he gave them the size, he gave them the dimensions, he gave them the materials. He architecturally drew it out. The Israelites did exactly as the Lord commanded. Listen, and the Bible says that the glory of God came and the priest could not even walk in the building 
to perform their duty because the raw glory of God was so strong the preachers could not even go in there and preach. My God, I'd love to see a service where the power of God is so strong I ain't even got to come in the building. <laughs> but to everything there was a pattern given. To everything the pattern was obeyed. And then the manifest presence of God, not the omniscient God, not the omnipresent God, not the, omni the manifest in your midst God. Just because we're having music does not mean we're having presence. Fact is, I kind of like our music. But what you don't know is, is just like the materials had to be assembled for the presence of God in the tabernacle and the materials had to be assembled for the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant and the, pres and the materials had to be assembled to build the temple which the Lord set up his glory. I've been trying to assemble the pieces because you can't just walk up in God's face. There is a pattern to the presence of God. In the presence, of, why do we want that, Pastor? In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy and at his right hand pleasures forevermore. Now, how many of you would love your life to be baptized in the fullness of joy and pleasures that chase you down in the street and tickle you like a kid? That comes in the presence of the Lord. And we have good people who love Jesus and passionate worshipers, but there's no glory. Because glory is where people's lives are affected and changed forever and things happen that they do not understand. And that's where I believe God is going to set up a church through us that are gonna turn the eyes because they're gonna say, I want what's happening in that room to happen in this room because if you ever taste God on that level, religion will never satisfy you again. It will never, just doing church and everything. Now, <clears throat> what is glory? Okay, you gotta understand, I'm gonna give you in about four minutes something that I preached one year on. 2016-ish, I think, 17, I preached 52 Sundays on the word glory. One word. So it's hard to wrap it up in five or six minutes. But that's not really my focus. It's a byproduct of where we're trying to go. Glory The Bible says that God crowned Adam with glory and honor. God does not wear clothes like we wear clothes. God is a as a reign in glory and in honor. When God made his son, Adam, out of himself, Psalm 8 says, and he crowned him with glory and honor and put all the works of his hands under his feet. So God made it and gave Adam the power to run it. The word glory means weight and authority. Pattern, obedience, glory. Pattern, obedience, glory. God gives the pattern, the people obey, and God then backs his people up with his authority and his weight. His weight. <clears throat> the Bible says that whatever Adam called it, that's what it was. I think that's really funny because Adam was God's last creation, which means everything walked around five days and didn't know what it was. Can you see the lion walking up to the sheep? Hey, are we friends? Do I like eat you? I don't know what's going on. And Adam comes along, you're a lion, you're a lamb, 
your leopard, your giraffe, your cedar tree, your palm tree, your pine tree, your whatever Adam called it because all of it was put under his authority. So when Adam would speak, he was crowned with glory, which means he would talk and heaven would back up what he said. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? Now I ain't getting many claps. Are y'all staying with me? Are you uh, get, make sure you with? Because I'm after something here. I'm after something that can separate us and make us be different and make us be a leader amongst God's people. And that's what I want us to be. Okay? We got great music. We got great worship. And these people love God. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about being after the manifest presence of God, okay? Now, to everything, there's a way. There's a way to peace, there's a way to blessing, there's a way to favor, okay? There's a way to a pure heart. To everything, God has a pattern. He will give you the pattern in his word and then he will let you obey that pattern. Then reward comes after obedience. So obedience is the master key to all things. You just need to obey. God takes care of the rest. Can I go deeper? Second Timothy, if you would, guys. <clears throat> Paul has started churches all over Asia. He's come to the end of his life. He's about to die and he's got this protege named Timothy. He's writing two letters to him because he's an up and comer. He says in verse one, perilous times are coming and he's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. I want you to tell me if this looks familiar. I'm going to read what he told him. He said, in the church, these people are going to have a form of godliness, but deny its power. Don't go to that church. I didn't get no love. I'm going over here. I am a preacher of second chances. I'll come back to you in just a minute. Okay. I'm just reading it. Then I'm go to verse seven. He said, they have a form of godliness and they deny its power, 2 Timothy 3, verse 7, and they're always learning, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth. Come on. Yeah. They're getting more savvy with their social media. They've learned how to incorporate corporate structure. They're really good with their organizational flow chart. They're PR savvy, they're marketing savvy. They know how to set up all the coffee shops in the church and make sure everybody's got a cappuccino or a latte. <laughs> Come on. They pass out the t-shirts and everybody's wearing the same thing. They got the youth group branded. They, they, they got a form. But when you look behind the curtain, it's empty. There's nothing in it. It's just form. And it basically what he's saying is, they always are trying to learn how to, but they never become. And your walk with God is not about doing things, it's about becoming. In other words, these churches do this, do this, do this, don't do this, you need to quit this, you need to start this, you need to stop. He said, that's what they, he said, it's not about that. Because let me tell you something, if you become everything you're supposed to become, you will automatically do everything you're supposed to do. So every time we meet together, what am I trying to do? Help you to understand you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are the healed of God. You are the beloved of God. You are the chosen of God. You are the adopted of God. You are the foreknown of God. You are the predestined of God. You are the called of God. You are the favored of God. You are the blessed of God. You are the sons and daughters of God. You are kings and priests of God. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's own people. Come on, do you understand what I'm talking about? It's not about putting a structure together that makes us look good. It's about everybody in the room understanding this is who I am. No wonder everybody's so confused because there's nobody in the pulpit telling people their identity. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Preach. 
preachers. Tell them who they are. They're confused. And when the pulpit is silent, the people will struggle. I'm 55 years old, I could care less. I've been doing this 33 years, I can take a bad comment on Facebook. <laughs> ah. Form of godliness, clouds with no water. Paul said, I didn't come to you with wise words of persuasive words of man's wisdom. He said, I didn't come to wow you with fancy things. He said, I came in demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost. He said, all I gotta do is get you in the presence of God one minute. And he said, I don't even have to be in the room. I can leave because when God starts healing and delivering and starts loving and forgiving and setting free, and God, he said, when God starts doing all that, he said, I don't have to talk you into it. The love of God will draw you into it. I am preaching. Somebody shout hallelujah. I gotta keep going. I'll, I'll, I'll start landing it with this. That Ark of the Covenant, you had an outer court, you had an inner court, then you had a curtain. And behind that curtain was the holiest of holies which sat the Ark of the Covenant. You could not go in there. Only one person could go in there and only one time a year could he go. It was the high priest. It was on the day of Yom Kippur, which meant the day of atonement, where he had to carry an unblemished lamb and sacrifice it, the blood of the lamb, for the sins of a nation. That priest was representing the sins of an entire nation one day a year. And he had to go through so many ceremonial cleansings before he was allowed to walk in there. They would take a rope and tie it to the right leg of the priest. Because if he went in there and he had missed one part of the pattern, the glory of God would immediately strike him dead and they would take him and drag him out by the rope. Now, how many of you would want to sign up for that ministry? <laughs> go through growth track. Yeah, I want to be that guy. You didn't just run into the presence of God. If God, did, if we weren't in the dispensation of grace, they would be dead bodies everywhere this morning. <laughs> because we just run roughshod over patterns and we don't understand why God's not there. Look, folk, let me tell you what I'm talking about, a form of godliness. Saul was Israel's first king. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He cared more about himself than he did God. Okay? And under his rulership, the Philistines knew that Ark of the Covenant, that was their secret sauce. As long as they had the presence of God, no army could defeat them. Nobody could stand against them if they attacked. Their crops were always fruitful. Their homes were always blessed because of that box and the presence of God on that box. Philistines knew if we can get that box, we can take them down. So they went and they seized it. Let me tell you about Saul. The priest would stand around the tabernacle and minister and worship 24 hours a day. The Philistines had come and taken the Ark of the Covenant and they kept singing songs because they keep doing what they're doing, their form, and they don't even know the power's gone. They just keep going through the motions. I don't want to be the church that just comes in and goes through the motions. And nobody say, well, where's the power? The presence of God was not even, there was no Ark of the Covenant behind the curtain, but everybody on the outside is acting the same old way. Form of godliness, no power. So David comes. David's been out 
in the field, killing lions and bears and Goliath and writing songs to God. <laughs> he loves the presence of God. When he comes into power, Saul is dead. First thing he says is, we're going to get the ark. They went back, led an attack, seized the ark, and we're going to bring it back to Jerusalem. Listen now. Everybody has good. We're not talking about bad church versus good church. We're talking about a pattern. Okay. David has the best of intentions and he has priests with him. The best of intentions. They've got the ark. They are taking it back to Jerusalem. And the Bible says that the ox stumbled. And when it did, the, the, the trailer leaned and it started sliding off. And a priest named Uzzah, Uzzza, Uzzah or Uzzah, went and stopped it. And immediately God struck him dead. Bam! And it says, David was upset with God. He said, I'm out here trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, but you're killing my folk. <laughs> Moving the Ark has a pattern. You don't just grab the Ark. You remember the movie, those of you old enough, The Raiders of the Lost Ark? And he looked at him and said, you're playing with powers beyond your wildest comprehension. You don't just go get an art of a covenant. It had to have poles through the ringlets overlaid in gold. It had to be carried on the shoulders of the priest. The priest could not touch the poles unless they had a lamb's blood on their ears, on their nose and on their feet. And although Uzzah was well-meaning, like 90% of our churches, he went to touch it, but totally ignored the pattern. We do that every Sunday. There's a pattern to the presence of God. And just singing songs is not it. Singing great songs and even great passionate worship is not automatically equating to God's presence in the room. If God's presence is in the room, I don't have to give altar calls. People will fall on the floor and say, what must I do to be saved? I don't have to have healing lines. In fact, I believe there's atmospheres. I prophesy one day it'll be impossible to come in here and stay sick. You say a day like that will never happen. I tell you it's going to happen and it's going to happen sooner rather than later because I believe that is what God is doing in this building. It's going to be impossible to come in here and still be an addict. It's going to be impossible to come here and still love the things of the world. It's going to be impossible to come in here and still have your tumor. It's going to be impossible to come in here and still have that generational curse on your life. It's going to come on somebody. I believe an atmosphere like that is possible. If you believe that, can you say amen with me? I got to quit. Now, okay, I, I am quitting. I really am quitting. I know I said I was quitting the last time. I really am quitting this time. This is what I was going to preach today, and everything else was just introductory leading up to it. So let me whet your appetite. Jesus is a king. A king has courts. You can go to Buckingham Palace and never see the royal family. Because to see the royal family, you have to go through a series of courts. And the courts of the king is his private, personal, protected atmosphere. To get in the presence of Jesus, you are trying to enter his personal space. Oh, that's so thick. And David always talked about these courts. What are we missing? Isaiah even talked about, the prophet said, the priests were trampling on the courts of God. In other words, he's saying, you're disregarding 
all of God's protocols and God's not going to meet with you. You just don't walk in on a king. And the courts are a progression. And what do you do in the courts to progress? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I'll enter his courts with praise. All of our churches today skip praise, cut all the lights off, make it pitch dark, and worship. You can't. You can't. Let me tell you why they skip praise, because praise is foolishness. And we're so cultured, and we're so prim, and we're so proper, and we've got so many accomplishments, and we're so educated that it's too foolish for me to dance around and clap my hands and shout. Holding on, it's foolishness. So get me straight to the thing where I can put one hand on my latte and the other one. <laughs> that fits me. Well, you can worship as it's fitting to you and never have the manifest presence. God will allow that. God will allow that. But if you want his presence, where there's the fullness of joy and his right hand pleasures forevermore, you have to do it his way. Let me, let me tell you how powerful this is. David said, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. He said, I can go see a thousand doctors or I can get in your presence one time. He said, I can go to a thousand rehabs and therapists or I can get in your presence one time. Oh, I'm about to preach this thing right here. Better is one day, one day in your court than a thousand other elsewheres. Stand on your feet with me if you would all over this building. Hug three people and say, I'm going. Come on, tell them. I'm going. I'm going. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to tell you something. I was pretty salty today. Do you still love you, Pastor? Yeah. If they jump on me on Facebook, you going to get on that thread and take up for me? Yeah. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May he establish you and may he give you peace in Jesus' mighty name. Go enjoy your day and guess what? Go Niners.